Welcome to our Facebook Live q and I'm Dr. Amy McKenzie, and I'm here with Dr. Stephen Finney. And we are researchers here at Verda, and we're collaborators, collaborators on quite a few projects now, I would say. Hey, um, Amy. Good yeah. to see you. Today we're here to answer any of the questions that you have about the recently published paper that we published in Diabetes Therapy, or any questions that you have about low-carb research in general. Um, if you can list your questions in the comments below the video, we'll try to get through as many as we can today. And uh, as a physician, licensed physician, I want to say that we can answer questions today, but please remember we cannot provide specific medical advice. And the thoughts we share with you today cannot replace the medical advice of your personal physician. So our first question, you just released Verda's clinical trial results for patients after a year in the treatment. Can you talk a little bit about what the results were and what they mean for diabetes care? Certainly we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we wanted to do with this study in this paper was look at the effectiveness of our care model. So our care model we generally refer to as the Verda treatment. And we wanted to know what effect that could have for patients with type 2 diabetes. So we looked at quite a few things. We looked at hemoglobin A1C and found that after a year on average, the patients who decided to pursue the Verda treatment could reduce their hemoglobin A1C by 1.3. When looking at weight loss, in this group, we saw 12% uh, loss on average. So for the average participant in the trial, that was about 30 pounds. And we also saw a reduction in diabetes medication. So most people could reduce, if not completely eliminate, the beds that they were on for diabetes. The other thing that we did with this trial is follow a group of patients who were not pursuing treatment with Verda. They were following kind of the usual and standard of care, uh, continuing to see their physicians, their endocrinologists, their diabetes educators. And what we saw with this group was that they had no change in A1C, no change in weight, no change in medications after that year. Um, so in terms of what we can say from the results of this study is that people who were willing to pursue treatment with Verda uh, had a pretty positive impact, I think, on their diabetes care and the markers of the disease. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, in terms of medication reduction, the ones that carried the highest risks were the ones that we eliminated mm -hmm. earliest, and those included insulin and the class of oral medications called sulfonylureas. And at the end of the year, everybody had stopped their sulfonylureas, and what was the number, Amy, like 91% of, of people either reduced or stopped their insulin? 94% on insulin. Yeah, I underestimated, sorry. Yeah, uh, Fair But th that's remarkable that, that people um, had a dramatic improvement in their mm -hmm. hemoglobin A1C and a reduction in their medication use. Uh, and so that really makes this a state very, very different from previous studies that looked at high intensity care with more medications. I think that's a really good point because, and this is kind of one of the ways that I think we impact diabetes care, it's often managed by putting more medications which lead to weight gain, which also sometimes confer a greater risk of hypoglycemic events or cardiovascular risk. Mm -hmm. So I think in this case where we're able to reduce A1C while reducing meds and while reducing weight, we're conferring much greater a much greater um, benefit to the patient in terms of reducing their overall risk profile. Right. And the other important concern that people have is, well, you know, you, you made their hemoglobin A1C get better, um, but other, a lot of other things might have gotten worse. We tracked a whole bunch of other things. Um, and uh, triglycerides went down, uh, biomarkers of inflammation went down, uh, the so-called good cholesterol HDL went up all of those were very significant, not just statistically, but in terms of meaningful changes. Clinically uh, meaningful changes. And so, and we had, as I recall, no reported serious adverse events in the study that were attributable to mm -hmm. the intervention. And this was in over 200 people with type 2 diabetes followed for a year. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, we didn't see major side effects, um, even uncommonly, uh, speaks to the safety of, of this mm -hmm. intervention. We have our next question. Next question is, why is metformin excluded from your definition of diabetes reversal? Uh, excellent question, because metformin was developed as a, uh, a, a medication for diabetes. It's one of its primary effects is to reduce production of glucose by the, by the, and mm -hmm. released by the liver. Um, but it also turns out that metformin uh, is a very effective drug for preventing type 2 diabetes. Mm 
And also, it, in animal models, it's been shown to increase longevity. Mm -hmm. So it, because it's an inexpensive drug, which um, has very few side effects, uh, it's no longer a diabetes-specific drug. Uh, and because it's effective for diabetes prevention and somebody who goes through Verta treatment and puts, you know, reverses their diabetes, um, they're still at risk of getting the diabetes back, certainly if they go back to eating a high-carbohydrate, low-fat diet. Uh, and so we see this as not as a diabetes treatment drug, but as we see metformin as a, a long-term preventative maintenance drug, and we mm -hmm. wouldn't, don't think it would be ethical to take it away from people unless they had significant side effects. Sure. Even in the ADA standards of care, it's still recommended for people who achieve an A1C under 6.5. Mm -hmm in terms of preventing progression back to diabetes. And then, let's see, our next question is, a recent study by Christopher Gardner seems to indicate that there is very little difference in weight loss between low-carb and low-fat diets. Can you speak to what the study means for low-carb research and your own research? My first thought on that is that I think definitions are very important. You know, you'll see in studies or in news headlines, um, low carbohydrate diet this or low fat diet that, and I think it's really important to know exactly what they mean when they say that. Um, if you think about what a low carb diet was in the context of Dr. Gardner's study, I think that after three months, uh, their diet records reflected that the participants in the study were eating 96 grams of carbohydrates, or I think it was about 25% of their caloric intake. And when you compare that to uh, low-carb diets that are in other studies, that's a much higher amount, I think, than some of the other research, especially compared to what Verda implements. Um, we're definitely much more under the 30 grams per day range for most of our patients or participants. Yeah, they did not measure ketones in that study, or if they did, they didn't report them mm -hmm. in the papers. But for the majority of that one-year duration, clearly the people who were randomized to the low carbohydrate diet were not in nutritional ketosis. Yeah, I don't think so. And then the other factor is they, they reported the caloric intakes very um, precisely. Um, and uh, the reported calorie intakes were almost identical to their resting metabolic rate. Now, when we're at rest, we burn fewer calories when we're standing up and walking around. The only time we burn less than resting is when we're mm -hmm. asleep. And typically, people burn or will, will burn 30% uh, more in a day than the average for their resting. What that means is 30% of the calories from this study weren't reflected in the diet record. So there's even more carbohydrate and or more protein coming mm -hmm. in. So if a diet is not well formulated, you, you can't be used as a benchmark for the efficacy of that kind of diet. It, it, you have to have that kind of, of diet. What that but for our research, what that means is we're going to keep on measuring ketones and mm -hmm. use that as our benchmark, not what people say they eat, because it really oftentimes, uh, even though people make the best effort to write down what they, they consume, isn't always accurate. Um, and you know, we will um, stand by our data where we see a much greater loss of weight in a, uh, a group of people who find it harder to lose weight. Mm -hmm. um, because the Gardner study excluded people with type 2 diabetes, and when you sure. have in severe insulin resistance, and particularly if you're on insulin and sulfonylureas, the higher insulin level makes it harder to lose weight. Sure. Uh, so our, we see our studies being very different than, than Professor Gardner's study. Yeah, I think in his study the, the main takeaway is that when you there's no difference between the advice that's given. If you advise people to consume a healthy low carbohydrate diet or you advise people to consume a healthy low fat diet, that's really what was tested in the difference in weight loss in that intervention since there was no marker of how adherent or no consideration of how adherent the participants in the study were. Yeah. And we have, the, at Verto, we have the added benefit where we're really looking at ketones as a marker of adherence, where we can explore that relationship a little bit further. It's not just a marker, it's, a, it's feedback to people. Absolutely. Of, you know, it's feedback on what you ate in the last yeah. 12 hours. And people, it, it becomes a self-reinforcing process for mm -hmm. people to understand the, the limits of this diet to maintain metabolic health. We have another question from Paul. Paul says, is it okay to eat less protein to keep ketones higher? What's the research on what happens to your body when you're consistently eating slightly less protein than the recommendations that you give in art and science? I think that's directed at you, Dr. Finney. Uh, I think it's a very good question, and we actually recently posted uh, 
a, I think, a fairly good answer to that on our blog. Um, uh, and by the way, Jeff, Jeff Bullock and I are trying to um, uh, provide a series of blog posts you know, on up-to-date material because the Art and Science book was published back in 2011, and we've made some progress since then. Uh, so you read the book, but then read the blog, too. Um, <coughs> so each of us has our own range of carbohydrate tolerance and to some degree protein tolerance in terms mm -hmm. of how much of those two macronutrients can we eat and still stay in nutritional ketosis. Mm -hmm. For some people who are more insulin resistant, they need to not just restrict carbohydrate but make sure they don't overeat protein. There is, for, however, some of those people a narrow range because if they undereat protein too much, they're not going to effectively maintain their lean tissue, muscle, and, and, and organ proteins as necessary for um, uh, 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 the full range of normal body functions. Um, so we don't um, uh, suggest restricting protein below a certain point, and technically that's 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of what we call reference body weight, and that's explained on our blog post. We prefer that most people start at 1.5 because that gives people a buffer for uh, whether it's physical stress like vigorous physical activity or infect mild infection or emotional stress, all of which can and make the body slightly less efficient in protein utilization. But our range typically is the 1.2 at the low end, 2.0 at the upper end. People should start around 1.5. Now, that's hard to calculate, so we basically give people a table in the blog post that show that for men and women at, at so many uh, feet and inches tall, a five foot six inch woman would eat this many ounces of protein rich foods. Um, because again, most of us in the US don't think in terms of grams. Um, ounces and so we, are a little bit more practical. We tra translate it into ounces uh, to make it a little easier for people to uh, have the specific range. And the other thing to do is you know, test your ketones. And um, if your ketones are low and, and you feel you're at the high end, then you can bring your protein down. But realize also that dietary carbohydrate is much more um, potent at reducing ketones than protein. So. Um, don't say, well, I'm going to eat real low protein but so I can have you know, brown rice with, with a meal. Uh-uh. You know, keep the, the starches and grains and, and uh, refined carbohydrates and sugars out of the diet. If you're already doing that in the, say, 30 to 50 grams of carbohydrate range, then you can try adjusting the protein. Our next question is, how does low carb affect cardiovascular health? Is it safe to do this if you have heart issues? Uh, I mean, I'm not a physician, but my opinion as a researcher, I would say it's looking pretty promising in terms of cardiovascular health. We have already talked about um, reducing A1C without medications and how that's going to benefit. Maintaining a lower A1C is beneficial in terms of cardiovascular risk. And if you look at all of the independent risk factors of cardio cardiovascular disease, A1C, weight, markers of inflammation, blood pressure, and you look at our trial outcomes, you see all of those things improve after a year. Triglycerides are going down, HDL is going up, weight is going down, inflammation is going down when we measure um, high, sensi high sensitivity CRP. Um, if we're seeing all of those markers that are generally um, markers of cardiovascular risk improve over the year as a result of eating um, a low carbohydrate diet, then I would think that this is pretty beneficial for cardiovascular health. Yeah. The other marker that we didn't study or haven't analyzed so far in the one year study is the blood level of saturated fat. Now there's mm. been a lot of debate about saturated fat and heart health and the idea that eating saturated, a lot of saturated fat is dangerous for you has, you know, the diet heart hypothesis um, has been, you know, seriously questioned, if not completely disproven in the last few years. But we know that the amount of saturated fat in the bloodstream is strongly correlated with heart attack risk and diabetes risk. Mm -hmm. So Jeff Volok and I, in a previous study, not with diabetes, but patients with metabolic, metabolic syndrome, syndrome, over a 12-week period of time where they're eating at, one group was assigned to a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet, and the other group was randomized to a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And the one on, people on the ketogenic diet were eating three times as much saturated fat as the people on low-fat diet. Mm -hmm. After 12 weeks, Guess what happened to the blood, blood levels of saturated fats? They were higher in the people on the low fat diet and lower in the people on the high fat diet. And how can you explain that? You know, because we've all been told you are what you eat. Actually, you are what you save from what you eat. And 
when you're at keto adapted, the body's ability to burn fat is markedly enhanced and saturated fats be, are rapidly oxidized so they can't build up in the body. So that other risk factor, which is harder to measure, you know, we physicians can't write a, a typically write a, 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 you know, for a patient to order a blood test for saturated fat levels, sure. it's a specialty test. But when we made the effort to look at that, it's clear that when people are keto adapted, they're perfected, uh, prevented from accumulating saturated fats. And even that factor will, will be eliminated as well. So I'll just take a break and welcome everyone who might be joining us a little bit late. Uh, this is the Verda Facebook Live q and I'm Dr. Amy McKenzie. I'm a research scientist here at Verda, and I'm here with Dr. Stephen Finney. He is our chief medical officer and co-founder at Verda. We're here to answer any questions that you have about our recent research on the effects of the Verda treatment or about other research on low-carbohydrate interventions. If you are looking for the latest research from us at Verda, you can find it on our website at verdahealth.com slash research. So our next question, this is an interesting one. Uh -huh. Cecily is asking, if money were no object, what would your dream study be? Uh, uh, yeah, blue sky question. Money's always yeah. <laughs> not Money, object. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've spent 40 years doing research on low-carb diets at a time when that wasn't popular with the funding agency, so I've learned to get a lot done with a relatively small amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people said, well, well why don't, you know, let's get the government to fund a really big study. Let's do something like the Women's Health Initiative, where we'll have 50,000 people mm -hmm. randomized to one or two diets. Uh, and I just don't think that science study is necessary because as we've already mentioned in terms of reduction in cardiovascular risk factors and uh, reversal of, of, of type 2 diabetes, um, this is a very potent and effective tool. Mm -hmm. um, but there will still be the skeptics who say, yeah, but you haven't proven that you save lives. And I think we very reasonably can expect that, that this intervention will save lives. And it's not going to take a big study when you cut hemoglobin A1C that much, when you reduce um, size is pretty large. Uh, inflammation biomarkers as, as much as we do. Uh, so my study would be a very well done, uh, carefully monitored, uh, randomized trial with a ketogenic diet versus a, let's take a Mediterranean diet. I mean, nobody advocates a high carbohydrate, low fat diet anymore, not seriously. Um, so a, a Mediterranean diet, you know, to say 40% vast fat versus a mm -hmm. ketogenic diet is in the 75% fat range. And let's plan to run that study for well, like, the, like the Leon diet heart study back in the 1990s sure. where they compared the high carbohydrate diet to the Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean diet run in two and a half years and they had to stop the study because it was saving lives. So I'd like to do something like the Leon diet heart study, um, maybe 500 to 1,000 people randomized to two arms. Uh, and followed until one diet proves itself superior to the other, and I think that would probably take less than five years. Sure. Probably Tightly not. controlled, making sure that people are adherent to the diets that they're supposed to be following. Yep. Sure. Yes. Yeah, I think that my, my take on this is maybe a little bit different. Maybe it's because I'm so new out of my PhD, is that if there's anything that I've learned as a scientist, it's that no one study is ever going to answer all of the questions in the world. And no study is ever perfect either. Mm -hmm. So I think that if I, had, if I had a dream, it would be that I could do you know, some study to answer a question and that I would be immediately handed money to answer the next question that I uncovered <laughs> after doing that study. Um, You're talking about tenure with funding. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. So I, I guess my dream would be that you know, we always have the funding available to do whatever the next question is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we don't have all the answers, and no. there's a lot of refining to do with this. Right now, we're, this program is clearly working well with the majority of our patients. Yeah. Uh, at one year, we're now collecting year two data, and we'll be looking at that later this year. Um, but that each time, that will raise questions of how can we make this better? And so yeah. incremental steps forward to refine this and to make it more applicable, more individualized, and more effective. I have a feeling that you can talk for hours on this next question. What is the research on inflammation and low carbohydrate interventions? Um, I mean, speaking to our trial and the data that we have now, if you look at the HSCRP data, we're seeing significant improvements in CRP from baseline to one year in this group of people. 
And I think that in the study you mentioned with um, Jeff and I think it was Cassandra Forsyth's paper, significant improvements in CRP. And then I think you did pro-inflammatory cytokines too, right? That yeah. one had TNF-alpha and IL-6. And I think at the end of those 12 weeks, you also had improvements. Yeah, that study was in people with metabolic syndrome for 12 mm -hmm. weeks duration. And uh, let me just say that, you know, different researchers have their pet biomarkers. So sure. somebody wants, you know, IL-6, somebody else likes, I mean, this sounds like alphabet soup here, um, uh, yeah. IL-1 beta or TNF-alpha or IGF-1, um, PI-1. I mean, these are all, so rather than pick somebody's favorite and, and upset somebody else because they, we didn't pick their favorite, we studied 14 biomarkers. Mm -hmm. in these people after 12 weeks. Uh, at, after 12 weeks, um, for all 14, none of them had a superior response, that is a, a greater lowering in the high carbohydrate, low fat group. Mm -hmm. So none of them were better off compared to the, the low carb ketogenic group. The key, low carb ketogenic group, seven out of the 14 were not just lower, but significantly lower. Okay. So which and both of them were weight loss studies. They were, both groups lost weight. Yeah. But the ketogenic diet markedly and consistently downregulated a, a number of biomarkers. And by the way, those are also bioactive compounds. They're also doing things. So we were changing inflammation at a number of different cellular sites within the body in a, in a coordinated way. And we think that's much better than targeting one single biomarker and making that go down, is what, which is typically done with drugs uh, that are targeted for anti-inflammatory effects. Sure. So our next question comes from Ian, and he's asking, what is the danger of the usage of SGLT2 inhibitors? I saw from your recent research paper that you stop them quickly. Is reducing this medication a benefit for people? This is really a, a, a fascinating question because there's data on both sides of this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, maybe you wanna start out. Sure. Uh, I think there's a little bit of evidence where people who are taking SGLT2 inhibitors are experiencing just from taking that drug alone, increase in ketones. Um, so when you combine that with a ketogenic diet and our increase in our ketones, you don't need both of them at the same time necessarily. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the, if we're getting reduced blood sugars from the nutritional intervention and we don't necessarily need a drug, this is one of the drugs that we can easily take away fairly quickly. Yeah. This is a new patented drug that's, that's quite pricey. Mm -hmm. It works by blocking the kidney's ability to hang on to blood sugar. So it lowers blood sugar by having people pee it out. Um, and um, you know, that uh, you know, can effectively lower blood sugar. Uh, the fascinating thing is that there is some evidence that that's associated with lower heart attack risk. Yeah. And from some studies that were just looking at safety to people's surprise, that it appeared to lower, and that's still being analyzed, how, you know, what's the mechanism of that? And it might be that a modest in, increase in, the slight increase, nowhere near as big an increase as we get with a well-formulated ketogenic diet, is having some benefits for the heart. Sure. The do other downside is there have been reported cases, quite rare, of what's called um, diabetic ketoacidosis, but with the normal blood sugar. So if somebody has diabetes and they're measuring their blood sugar and it looks fine and they're not worrying and then they start feeling ill, nauseated, uh, weak, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, go to see their doctor and they find out the ketones are not just slightly elevated, but quite elevated, um, that those, a few of those cases have been reported. Uh, and again, it's not exactly clear what the risks are, but, but uh, that has led to this kind of um, push-pull between benefits and risks. Mm -hmm. Our feeling is, A, our patients don't need them because we're lowering blood sugar more effectively with the well-formulated ketogenic diet. Uh, and B, we're kind of caught in the middle on this, this issue of safety. Um, mm -hmm. We think our patients are safer when they do use them, and some of them do use them, because they're measuring ketones. And if they see ketones go above the four to five range, they can contact their vertebra physician right away and, and decide what to do in terms of medication change or even seeing their uh, physician or an emergency care setting. Yeah, and when we talk about going back to our very first question in terms of, you know, what does the Verta treatment do for diabetes care? I think this is one of the things where we can really contribute a lot where there's continuous monitoring. 
and we know, you know, if we have someone on an SGLT2 inhibitor and we're continuously monitoring their glucose and their ketones, we can keep track of this stuff very closely and between the patient, the health coach, and the physician, we can manage that much more carefully than somebody who may be going to see their physician once every three months. Yeah. So our next question comes from Monica. And Monica is asking, can magnesium deficiency cause postural or sleep position neural trembling? And how much magnesium should we be consuming daily? Uh, good question. Yeah. I think uh, in terms of the, the sleep position neural trembling, uh, that may be what's called restless leg syndrome. Mm -hmm. And some people, when they sleep, um, have uh, trembling or even quite vigorous movements of of arms and legs, um, and there are quite a few case reports of that being associated with um, uh, what we would call magnesium depletion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the blood test for magnesium is not very sensitive in picking that up, and so people have oftentimes normal levels, but they have symptoms. And so the way to, to uh, address that question is what we call a therapeutic trial. Um, uh, so if somebody has this uh, and this can, A, wake them up, and it's oftentimes very unsettling for a partner to have the person in bed with them, uh, you know, having uh, 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 unexpected movements. Um, so uh, we use a slow-release form of magnesium, um, and uh, uh, that's more effective in terms of getting magnesium absorbed into the body without having a laxative-like effect. And we have people take three pills of this um, uh, uh, slow release magnesium per day for typically for three weeks mm -hmm. and if it's going to help it'll typically help in three weeks that may not be sufficient it's you know because people take it for three weeks and then stop um, if that magnesium redistributes into the bones which contain typically half the body's magnesium you may need more and if the sim symptoms come back take it again uh, and I know some people who take two or three of these uh, magnesium pills per day long term mm -hmm. because that's what it takes to hold it in um, kind of, you know, in abeyance, um, and then the dose of that is about um, about half of what's considered the recommended dietary allowance for magnesium. This is not high dose magnesium right. intake, and if you buy them uh, in the generic version, the, the uh, slow release magnesium chloride plus calcium chloride, the combination together, um, it costs about in, in ten dollars a month. Um, Not too bad. Uh, uh, for for that, if it's if it's required for long term, this is also what we do with with uh, nighttime muscle cramps and post exercise muscle cramps in people, and both those seem to be pretty more common in people with diabetes, potentially because that's a a sign of early effect of diabetes on the kidney and making it harder for the kidney to retain magnesium. Sure. Now, I've always said that magnesium is my least favorite nutrient. And I say it because it's one of my favorites, but it doesn't get any respect, and nobody wants to listen to me talk about it, so I'll, I'll just stop talking about it at this point. Thank you well, for the question. Yeah, and if you're looking for magnesium from your foods, you can always go for you know dark leafy greens, almonds, salmon, things like that also have some magnesium. And home, homemade uh, uh, meat broth. Bone broth, yeah. Bone broth will also contain it, you know, much more so than, than commercial broths that, that you buy. Um, and we have recipes for that. Uh, I don't know if we have it on the website, but they're certainly in, in our books, the art and science books. Yeah. So if you're just joining us, I just want to welcome you to our Verda Facebook Live Q&A. We just published our one-year outcomes from the trial that we are doing in partnership with Indiana University Health Arnett in Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, we've demonstrated the outcomes of our intervention for patients with type 2 diabetes. If you're looking for uh, our papers and our research, you can find them on our website at vertahealth.com research. And otherwise, we have Dr. Stephen Finney and I'm Dr. Amy McKenzie, and we're here to answer any questions that you might have about that research that we recently published or any other low-carb research questions that you may have. So our next question is, has there been any recent research on fatty liver and nutrition? This is really exciting. There was a really cool paper the other day that, the other day, maybe it was a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, that came out in cell metabolism. And the thing that I really like about cell metabolism is that they, they try to do the translational research between looking at mechanisms and also doing something very practical in humans. So they took a group of people with fatty liver 
and they put them on a ketogenic diet. And they found some really interesting things over time. So they only did this for two weeks, so very different in scale in terms of what we're doing uh, with our trial. But they brought the people in, they did all of their baseline measurements on them, and in just one day, they saw a significant reduction in fat content in the liver. And I think it was reduced by almost half after 14 days at the end. And then just to make sure that the ketogenic diet was the, the driver behind that change in their liver fat content, after the people ended the study and they went back to consuming their typical diet, they brought 10 of their subjects back in one to three months later and measured their liver fat content again and saw it return almost back up to baseline in just that one to three months after they had completed the intervention. Um, so I think this is really interesting and it's showing a lot of promise in terms of um, different ways that we can use nutrition to treat fatty liver. And you know, if we're not, um, if we can cut down some of the fat content and explore some of these mechanisms, I think it's gonna be a really interesting research area. Yeah. This is a real paradox because, again, I said before, there is this common myth that you are what you eat. And people assume, well, if you eat a high fat diet, then all that fat's gonna go through your digestive system and end up in your liver. Um, but that's not what happens. Uh, sure. The liver uh, becomes very efficient at clearing the fat. Um, some of it is, uh, is made into ketones, maybe as much as 100 grams of, of fat is, by, is made into ketones by the liver each day uh, when somebody's on a well-formulated ketogenic diet. So the liver's not a place where the fat goes to hide or reside uh, yeah. when, you, when you're keto adapted. Um, and there's more re research being done on that. Our, uh, uh, my co-author and scientific collaborator and very good friend, Dr. Jeff Volick at Ohio State University, is doing some very precise imaging studies on people on a ketogenic diet over a three-month period of time. Uh, and that research should hopefully be uh, uh, published later this year. Um, and uh, we're looking at, at uh, more sophisticated biomarkers in our uh, Lafayette uh, uh, mm -hmm. research study, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be publishing that data shortly as well. Yeah, this study uh, did a really nice look at some of the underlying mechanisms to show that de novo lipogenesis was actually slowed. They showed the increased rate of ketone production, so they were showing that beta oxidation rates were going up. Um, so they did a really nice, I think, elegant job of showing some of those very early changes even before adaptation occurred, potentially, mm -hmm. because they were seeing those changes in three, five, seven days. Mm -hmm. And stepping back a bit, just up until four or five years ago, there were very few people doing research. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. well done research on ketogenic diets. You know, in fact, life was kind of lonely back then. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing more and more really top-notch research groups getting uh, engaged in this area. And I think we'll, you know, A, it's, it's good to have more good minds looking at, at this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and uh, again, our job is not to prove we're right, but to you know, find out where we're wrong and mm -hmm. correct those things. And it's really great to see other people coming in who you know, uh, aren't considered advocates in this area um, uh, doing high quality research, such as this recent paper in Cell Metabolism. Yeah, definitely very nice to see. So our next question is coming from Ian, and he says, do we have any evidence that maintaining a low A1C due to a low carb diet has long-term benefits? I think so. I think. There's evidence to say, at least from an epidemiological perspective, that the cardiovascular risk with a lower A1C is improved. Mm -hmm. So for every point lower that you can maintain your A1C, your cardiovascular risk is lessened. Um, and I think we've already talked about this a little bit in terms of um, how much risk is conferred when you're reducing A1C with a pharmacological means versus nutrition. Yeah. So if you're, a lot of times I think maybe it was in the annals the other day, they came out with a statement about what the A1C targets should be for pharmacological interventions, and maybe they're, maybe they're a little bit higher than we think. And I think where that information is coming from is that if you're using intensive medication management to lower A1C, you're creating a whole different risk profile for sure. the patient. The side effects of the medications are greater with the higher the dose of the medication. So more sure. insulin, more risk of hypoglycemia. So I think the the you know, um, uh, uh, the diabetes literature has 
has been based mostly on, on studies done with more medication, mm -hmm. such as the look ahead study. Uh, and so um, how you get to a lower hemoglobin A1C value would indicate where that the safest place is. And yeah, because we reduced it by 1.3 at one year in this mm -hmm. study, uh, by cutting medica total medication use almost in half, mm -hmm. um, uh, is very different than cutting, dropping it by, say, by one uh, percentage point, which uh, some of the intensive interventions have done, but they use 50% more medication. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just the destination, but how you get there that determines this. Yeah. But again, I would like to run a long-term study, a you know, five-year study and a few hundred people, um, uh, and look at the, the you know, look at outcomes. And I think we'll mm -hmm. find that, that uh, if you can get to a, a value under 6.5 and hold it there for years, it's going to be a lot safer if you do it with a ketogenic diet. It's going to be a lot safer if you do get, achieve the same result by using a lot more medication. Yeah, and the two things that people often point out with medication management, uh, hypoglycemic events and um, weight gain. Mm -hmm. And we, have, we had no hypoglycemic events that were, contrib that were attributed to the intervention, and we had weight loss on average in our participants. So. Yeah, 79% uh, of people lost more than 5% of body weight. Mm -hmm. you know, when we say 12%, you say, well, maybe there were five people that, that lost 100 yeah, pounds each. No. no, on average, most people lost some and many people lost a, a very significant amount of weight. Sure. There's been some recent research indicating that erectile dysfunction may be an early sign of insulin resistance. Can you comment on this? I'm not so familiar of anything recently, but I know this has been looked at uh, at least a few years ago in a couple of different ways. I remember one study that looked at um, the number of components of metabolic syndrome that someone had. So did you have three, four, or five of the factors of metabolic syndrome? And, and that's just remind people that's uh, central obesity, it's hypertension, it's yeah. high triglycerides, it's low HDL, and it's uh, borderline high glucose, not quite in the diabetes range. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more of those five factors you have, the greater the risk of having erect erectile dysfunction. It's strongly associated with type 2 that prevalence of type 2 diabetes and, and coronary disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you know, if that's an, again, most of the signs of, of metabolic syndrome, those five things I mentioned, are painless. You don't mm -hmm. notice them. So again, uh, erectile dysfunction can be a warning sign. Go see your doctor and maybe get a blood test. Yeah, definitely some of the researchers who have looked into this have suggested that this should be an early sign for physicians looking a little bit more into um, risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular risk. Yeah. And the other interesting, um, I think, relationship there was that the people who, when you had more of the components of metabolic syndrome and the higher prevalence of ED, it was also um, higher CRP levels in those people. So there were higher levels of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So there might be another underlying factor playing a role in the pathophysiology there. Yeah. Again, CRP is C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation. And inflammation also is known to be an early predictor of heart disease, diabetes, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the more common forms of cancer and Alzheimer's. Yep. So again, these are all things that A, are, you, know, you don't want to let them go unchecked long term, and B, increasingly our, our evidence is that, that the Virta treatment is uh, a very effective way of reducing inflammation biomarkers, sure. and we had uh, like a what a forty percent, thirty nine or forty percent reduction yep. in CRP at one year, and there's no doubt drug that is primarily, uh, a, you know, a, where where that's the primary purpose of that drug that can have that kind of effect. Mm -hmm. All right, our next question is: What upcoming research are you excited about? I, I would think say there's two categories. The stuff ahead. we know that's upcoming and the stuff that we don't know, but we're going to be thrilled, yeah. to, thrilled to see. Yeah. So. I think, so when we started this trial in 2015, we set it up as only a, a two-year long intervention. Um, and very quickly we were like, man, what happens after that point? Mm -hmm. And we, we've been very fortunate that we were able to extend this trial to five years. And I think I'm really excited about this because a lot of time the criticism that low carb nutrition gets is that, you know, where's the long term evidence and the long term data on what impact your intervention has. So I think, you know, there are some great studies that are in the in the research now that are at the two year mark uh, in terms of what 
low carb nutrition can do for people with type 2 diabetes. But I think we're going to get a really unique opportunity to look at what happens at years three, four, and five. And in all of that data that's collected, I think we're going to have, and plus we have, we talked about having ketones as a marker of adherence. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a lot of really unique and interesting relationships that we're going to be able to explore with that data in terms of outcomes. Yeah. Again, being kind of the old man here and thinking long term of how things have changed, uh, we still get the criticism that nobody can stay on this kind of diet long term. And so I wouldn't ever get funding to do a five-year study yeah. unless we prove that a lot of people can, can actually do this for five years. Yeah. Uh, and right now we have close to 300 people who are still active in our intervention um, uh, coming up towards the, the, the two-year mark. Yep. I probably shouldn't be allowed to say that. But, uh, you know, it's, it, and and uh, the other exciting thing is, as I mentioned, there are other people who realize this is a fruitful area for research, not just looking at outcomes, but figuring out why these things happen. Yeah. And we now know that beta-hydroxybutyrate is a gene signaling, what we call epigenetic signal, that alters how our genes work. Mm -hmm. So if you're born with a bad gene, but ketones turn it off, it's like not being born with a bad gene. Um, and we actually uh, have, and there are people with much more sophisticated knowledge of uh, gene regulation than I will ever have, um, who are in engaging this research, um, this area of research now. Yeah. And then my colleague and friend and co-author, Dr. Jeff Volick, is running, I mentioned the, the study on a group of people for three months at, at Ohio State University looking at both physical and f psychological resilience. They're mm -hmm. doing the study in in ROTC students, and only the military is allowed to put people under stress on purpose. You know, um, I, you know, I won't say they're out in the firing range having machine gun bullets going overhead, but uh, they're actually studying uh, not just you know but can people do f vigorous physical uh, tasks, but you know what's their um, uh, mental resilience under stress, sure. and that's being stu uh, studied. Uh, and Jeff is also doing an early uh, pilot study in, uh, with a ketogenic diet in, patient, in patients with cancer, working with the oncologists there. And I think that's a very important area of research um, mm -hmm. uh, around the regulation of cell growth, abnormal cell growth. Yeah. And, and again, it's an area where um, the ketones aren't just a fuel. The ketones signal genes, and that may have a role to play, you know, not as a miracle cure, but potentially as a very potent adjunct for treating certain kinds of cancer. Yeah, and from a very practical uh, implementation perspective, you know, how much, how much ketones do we need? Mm -hmm. How many do we need? What's the concentration that we need to actually elicit the genotype effects that we want to see, the epigenetic effects? So it's, you know, how much do we need? How long does that need to be maintained? How long are those uh, epigenetic changes maintained? Yep. There's a lot to do in terms of understanding what the mechanisms are behind this and how much of a signal you need to actually get those changes. Yeah. And there's a lot of really interesting um, applications of a ketogenic diet in the literature now too, with cluster headaches and depression, and we've you know it's been in seizure literature for years. So, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of interesting things coming. Research being done with dementia and yeah. Uh, uh, people doing imaging of, of, of the human brain and people with er early Alzheimer's and they show that the early Alzheimer's brain, uh, long before there are major symptoms, there are parts of the brain that just aren't burning glucose. Mm -hmm. And when you give the brain ketones, you can see those cells light up, you know, become more active um, uh, when you offer them ketones as a fuel. Um, so uh, again, the future is, um, uh, promising. No Exciting guarantees. Too. But yeah. No, we'll learn yeah. a lot. We'll be able to come back and talk about this more later. <laughs> so if you're just joining us, we just want to thank you for joining us on our Verda Facebook Live Q&A. Uh, I'm Dr. Amy McKenzie and this is Dr. Stephen Finney and we are researchers here at Verda and we uh, recently had our one-year outcomes from our uh, trial at Indiana University Health Arnett published in Diabetes Therapy where we reported what our one-year outcomes were for the Verda treatment on patients with type 2 diabetes. If you're looking for that research, you can go to verdahealth.com slash research and find all of our papers there. So our next question is coming from Lewis, and Lewis asks, would you consider the diet just as beneficial for long-term diseases of aging in a lean muscular patient with starting insulin of two or three pre-existing insulin sensitivity? 
Is there any long-term data on this in humans? The simple answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say next question. Yeah, it's a very good question. There is, yeah. there's been a um, long history, meaning decades worth of history on calorie restriction and longevity. Mm -hmm. And there are a group of people um, who are purposely restricting calorie intake uh, to try to prolong their, their mm -hmm. lives. Um, and uh, there's some active research in that area. The problem with human research on longevity is it takes a long time. And having people- Do you have people, enough years for that? Having people, you know, knowing if, if people stick with this, you know, because you yeah. can't lock them in cages. We, we do, I mean, some people take yeah. issue with this, we do lock mice in cages. Yeah. And there have, were two papers published this last year in September in Cell Metabolism. Yeah. Um, uh, from two separate research groups that looked at varying degrees of carbohydrate restriction, either intermittent ketosis or continuous ketosis in mice. The one that used intermittent ketosis showed that uh, the uh, mid-range lifespan of mice was improved, but their total longevity was not improved. In other words, the mm -hmm. longest live, live mice yeah. on the high carb versus low carb was different, but at halfway through the study, there were more mice alive on the ketogenic, intermittently ketogenic diet. Uh, the second study involved three diets, a very high carbohydrate kind of standard mouse diet, a low carbohydrate but not ketogenic, it was about 20% of energy as carbs, and then a, a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, mice typically live for 900 to 1,000 days. So it's yeah. a, a three-year-long study. Uh, it takes mm -hmm. little, you know, patience and, and care because you don't want any diseases to get into the mouse colony. And so it, it's really fastidious research to do. Yeah. But this group at UC Davis, you know, who were experienced in doing that kind of study, demonstrated two things that were striking. One is, on average, the ketogenic dice mice lived 13% longer than the control animals on the, the high-carb diet. And the mm -hmm. ones that had somewhat, some carbohydrate restriction were partway in between. Mm -hmm. But there was a very significant improvement in longevity with the ketogenic diet compared to the high-carb diet. More importantly, and this may come to the, the question that, that was asked, and that is, at 900 days when the mice are getting quite old, they did tests of both physical performance and mental acuity. Mm -hmm. And the mice on the ketogenic diet maintained the same values they had at, at 300 days out to 900 days. So their mental and physical performance were well maintained, whereas they were markedly reduced, as, as is commonly seen with, yep. the, with the high carb diet. So if you think, and, and there are lots of cases where mice are not good uh, indicators of, of how humans respond, but that's encouraging data in terms of, of preservation of physical and neurological function uh, with advanced age in an animal model. Sure. So our next question is coming from Travis, and he's asking, what is the research on completely carnivorous diets of all animal products? I think the first thing that comes to my mind is what the Stefanson experiment they yeah, there were two Arctic explorers ate who, meat for a year? who lived among the Inuit uh, in the Arctic as, as explorers and came back and said, hey, I, we could live without vegetables, fruit and vegetables for <coughs> up to a couple of years at a mm -hmm. time and not get sick. And everybody, that was when vitamin C was discovered as, as the cause of scurvy. And, and everybody knew if you took away vitamin C for four months, people would develop signs of scurvy, which aren't subtle. You know, your teeth get loose, your joints swell up and hurt. You have sure. these little black spots where you have bleeding in the skin called petechial hemorrhages, and so they said, so a group of researchers said this is not possible, and they basically locked them up in a hospital, it was a mental hospital, mm -hmm. uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York City, and followed them for uh, anywhere three to five months locked up, and when they didn't develop scurvy, they said, okay, you can move to an apartment down the street, but you gotta come in every day to get checked. And they did this diet of just meat and fat. Now, they weren't eating the same things they had in the Arctic because you know, they didn't have seal and, and right. seal blubber and Slightly caribou and so on. So they were using market meats at the time. This was in the 1920s. But both of them remained very healthy for that whole year. Mm -hmm. But realized that both these, these people, A, they, they got to choose what they ate as long as it was from meat and fat. Yep. You know, so they could have organ meats and things like that. Um, uh, and they had basically been trained by a group of people who'd lived for at least 50, the modern Inuit have lived in the Arctic for, I think, archaeologists say 1,800 years. Uh, and so they had a time empirically to figure out what to eat and what proportions to eat. Um, and, uh, uh, and so that's different than, than maybe what, if we 
if somebody just said, I'm just going to eat meat, they may, mm-hmm. may they may not eat enough fat. They may not make their own broth. They may not uh, follow those tenets as yeah. closely uh, as the, the Aboriginal cultures did. Um, so there were a lot of lessons that, that these Aboriginal cultures probably learned, mm-hmm. and we, you know, as uh, you know, of European and you know, Western civilization, uh, uh, may have discounted the value of those sure. things, especially with respect to minerals. Sure, and my concern, uh, we see a lot of uh, problems with m- sodium, potassium, and magnesium um, intakes in people who casually go onto a low carbohydrate diet. And that particularly concerns me if somebody's not eating vegetables because that's where a fair bit of the magnesium and yep. potassium that, that our, pa- our patients eat, that's where it comes from. So if one doesn't eat vegetables, then it puts a, a more responsibility on that person to get enough of those minerals from, from the animal sources. And that may be a, an issue around making one's own broth, particularly bone sure. broth. And again, it's not sticking a few bones in some water and boiling it for an hour. That's a, cooking it long enough to get those, those nutrients out of the bone and into the broth. Mm-hmm. So thank you for listening so far. I think we're going to have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then all of the questions that are left over, we'll do our best to answer on Facebook for everyone after the event is over. So our next question is coming from Susan, and she asked, is the same type of research on low-carb interventions happening for childhood diabetes? Mm-hmm. Um, Excellent question. Yeah. Um, and studying children uh, goes by under a, a, a very, uh, let's say, a more strict Different eth- ethical considerations code. considerations from eth- the IRB. Ethical code. We cannot do research, any research on humans without having what's called institutional re- review board or a human subjects committee approval. And that's mandated, mandated by an inter- international agreement originally signed in 1975. Um, and getting research or getting consent to do research from children is much much more complex. You have to get the parental approval, but you you, know, you have to take the, the 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 balance of the child's well-being in, in account. That said, um, there are a number of researchers now in the pediatric endocrinology area who are um, very interested doing doing research um, with a well-formulated ketogenic diet in children. Uh, and realize that this is not a novel area for diets with children because since the 1920s, this, uh, a ketogenic seizures. diet has been a very effective tool. And that before there were drugs for seizures, it was mm-hmm. the only tool for pediatric seizures. Uh, and uh, it uh, went through a kind of a, the ketogenic diet for seizures went through kind of a low period of popularity when the modern anti-seizure drugs came out in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. But then we realized that about a third of children have what's called drug-resistant seizures. It, the, the, those right. don't work. And for many of those children, a ketogenic diet has a dramatic positive effect. And some children go on the diet for a year, and then they can transition back to a broader range of foods. Some of those children have to stay on a ketogenic diet long term. Mm-hmm. And the beneficial effects, when done carefully and, and if, um, uh, uh, eff- efficaciously, let's say, yeah. Um, the beneficial effects are undeniable, and most major medical centers now offer that treatment. So there's no reason why we can't consider that for type 1 diabetes uh, as well. Uh, but yeah. there's, the, the research is going to be a little bit more uh, challenging, challenging to, to do. Yeah. yeah, it's a protected population and a, a few other considerations in terms of how we get consent. Um, but there's definitely precedence for it in terms of where it's been studied in other, in other disease states. Right. Our next question is coming from Mihalo. What are our general chances to avoid diabetes if we continue doing ketogenic, low-carb, high-fat diet in light of very strong genetic or family predisposition from both parents' sides? Uh, if well, Dr. Gardner's a, study would have been ketogenic, this would have been a great question to answer. Well, we, there are lessons from, from um, uh, uh, epidemiology, from yeah from uh, Aboriginal populations. We know there are some populations like Asian Pacific Islanders, mm-hmm. um, uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, First Nations in, in Canada, who have a very high prevalence of diabetes now. But if you go back two generations, their grandparents didn't have diabetes. Sure. Which the gene pool hasn't changed. What has changed is you know, modern, refined um, uh, sugar and high carbohydrate uh, foods. Um, 
Uh, and so uh, that would indicate that if, if people go back to that type of diet who have that high genetic or a, 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 a strong genetic uh, predilection, that diabetes would get better. And we actually attempted to do that. Dr. Jay Wortman in, in British Columbia, who's uh, a uh, Métis uh, uh, physician, that's um, basically a mixed race Aboriginal uh, physician in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, uh, got funding to do a study in a, uh, a village uh, in, on the British Columbia coast of where the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is very high. And we convinced a, a, a group of people to, to go back to a diet that looked like what their ancestors ate, but again, much of it had to come mm -hmm. from market foods, not from, from the fish and the seafood, the shellfish and the, the land animals that they'd lived on for thousands of years. And the initial responses to the diet were excellent. The political blowback, however, was, was kind of difficult. And you know, for many of them, they couldn't sustain that because there were so many people finger pointing, saying, oh, you sure. shouldn't be doing that. That's dangerous, uh, et cetera. And that was um, almost 10 years ago. So we're now, I think, in a better position to uh, maybe work with some of the um, uh, populations that are most vulnerable. Sure. And the places we see that is the Asian Pacific Islander, Aborigine, uh, uh, North Americans from Canada and the United States. And also in the Gulf states, um, mm -hmm. in the, um, uh, the, the um, Bahrain and, and uh, United Arab Emirates and the, the Saudi Arabia, the prevalence of diabetes is on the order of 30%. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some physicians there who are beginning to use a, a ketogenic diet and seeing dramatic benefits uh, of going back to a less refined and, and uh, a more something approaching a ketogenic diet. Yeah, even if you take it from the perspective of carbohydrate tolerance and consider each person's individual carbohydrate tolerance, if you can maintain your carbohydrate intake under your personal level of tolerance for a significant period of time, you're probably going to reduce your chances of developing diabetes without that stimulus. Mm -hmm. So I think that brings us to the end of a very, I think, productive hour. Mm, time flies. <laughs> yeah. I think it's been a great conversation and it's been really great to hear all of your questions and I'm, I think I'm honored and thankful that we've had a chance to have this discussion and discuss all of this with you all. So thank you for listening. Uh, follow our page, Verta Health, and get notified about our future live Q&A sessions and other content that we have. Um, and for those of you who we didn't get to your questions, we'll do our best to touch base after this and get back to you on Facebook. And maybe we'll be back in six or nine months and tell you about our two-year data. Oh, I hope so. Yep. It's coming up soon. Thanks much. Thank you.